as a public service, the crew at Left at the Valley proudly presents Know Your Fallacies with Liam Johnson. Good evening. I've taken time out of my busy schedule to briefly explain to you, the freethinker, the finer points of logical fallacies. With some practice, attention to detail, and of course, my guidance, you too will easily disarm any fobbing, hasty-witted fustilarian who dares cross linguistic blades with you. Today, let's look at the simplest attack for a mammering lout could use. The ad hominem. Ad hominem fallacies involve attacking a person rather than their argument. For example, by casting aspersions on that person's character, or associating the person with a distasteful ideology. Kevin is French. What does he know about personal hygiene? This attack on my odorific friend is a logical fallacy because the fact that a person is repugnant does not mean that they are wrong. Hey, I'm Attacking right here! Attacking your character when you are stating facts is a clear sign of desperation from your unmuzzled, plume-plucked opponent. Make sure you resist the temptation to do the same. Note that not every use of a personal remark qualifies as an ad hominem. Consider the following remarks that one might make towards a young Earth creationist. You'd have to be an idiot to believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. In this sentence, a personal insult was used. However, the insult was based on the argument being made, and furthermore, the insult follows from the disagreement, not the other way around. The argument technique used is overly emotional, and the assertion of idiocy may be wrong, but it is not ad hominem. Additionally, there is this sort of argument. William Dembski is a mathematician, not a scientist. Why would we take his disbelief about evolution seriously? This is also a personal remark about Dembski, yet it is directly relevant to the subject of argument. Since Dembski is often used as a source of argument from authority, it is certainly relevant to question his credentials. A person who has not studied science is, indeed, less qualified to act as an expert about evolution. Now go forth, my friends, and remember, knowledge is power. The one who knows wins. Until next time. Hey there, heathens. I'm John, the godless engineer, and I took a left at the valley. Fantastic. I know we shouldn't have to scream that we're atheists. You know, we don't have non-astrologers and all that. But with the religious people taking over the world, I mean, we can either speak up or be pushed into a corner. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non-believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith in unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist. Coming at you from Holier Than Thou, BC, this is Left of the Valley. My name is Kevin, and Bigfoot once captured a short, grainy video of me. Was he scared? <laughs> Nobody believed him. <laughs> Joining me as usual is a team that the Boogeyman checks for under his bed every night. Yup, and I'm always there. <laughs> <laughs> she once challenged a fish to a breath-holding contest. The fish lost. Nancy. Oh. <laughs> She was bitten by a dog, and the dog needed a shot. Christina. Yeah, I am pretty toxic. <laughs> the black-eyed peas were originally the peas. That was before they met her, Kirsten. Damn straight. <laughs> Ladies, welcome back. Hope you had a great week. It, it was pretty decent. It was a busy one. Yeah. The guy here on a Saturday morning, but anyway, we're, we're okay. <laughs> so far, so good. Yeah, fall is here. <laughs> it's oh. raining, guys. I know. It's raining. Isn't fall supposed to be officially <sighs> 20? We don't care about official yeah, I'm dates. ready to go into hibernation until oh, May. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Summer was nice. But fall is the best time of year. Fall is the mm-hmm. best time of year. So today we'll, we'll be talking to our friend Jessica, the therapist, and we'll be talking about de-escalation. Yay. So that's going to be very interesting and informative. But first, let's do a little chit-chat. Got lots this week. Yeah. Remember last week we talked about there was a hole in the International Space Station? Yeah. yeah. In the Russian Soyuz capsule? Well, now they're actually talking that it might be not a defect, but could have been sabotage. Wait, seriously? Someone tried to kill the astronaut? Well, they don't know at this point. You see, it seems the, the two millimeter hole was made by a drill. So it's either somebody really screwed up and drilled a hole in the wall during the manufacturing process, or somebody tried to sabotage the capsule. Hmm. It, so, the is, mystery deepens. That would mean someone up there would have had if they were sabotaged. Wouldn't that mean someone on the space station did it? Well, maybe they, maybe it was sabotaged before they launched the Soyuz capsule. I don't know. How long ago was it launched? 
I that's a good question. But I don't have that information. Wouldn't it have been difficult for somebody on board to do it? I mean, what would you use to drill that hole in the? Oh, they have they have tools like that. No, I mean, but. but I'm just wondering whether or not they could do it privately and secretly, or that. Who knows? Yeah. It'd be interesting yeah. to find out what, you know, what the real cause is. Well, right now they're investigating this. They're yeah. keeping all the avenues open. Chances are, I think chances are, and this is my speculation here. It was probably during the manufacturing process. Somebody drilled a hole where they weren't supposed to, and nobody noticed it. That's probably what happened. To say sabotage, yeah, you know, yeah. but it could be a possibility. Yeah, I would much rather it just be a gaff. Yeah. So, legendary actor Burt Reynolds, dead at the age of 82. <laughs> oh, I love your suits. It must be a bitch getting a size 68 extra fat and a 12 dwarf. Mm. Yeah, this was a leading man during the 70s and 80s. Um, everybody kind of knew Burt Reynolds. He was famous for a lot of things. You know what was I thought was just amazing about the man? Is he did some interesting movies, but... It's the number of roles that he refused, which almost made him even more famous. He really? refused. Yes, he refused the role of Indiana Jones. Wait, what? Well, I'm kind of happy because yeah, he um, refused the role of Han what's... Solo. <laughs> he, re- he refused the role of uh, Bruce Willis Harris, in Die Hard. Harrison Ford's just sitting there. What? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I I met him once. Of of course you have. <laughs> no, I really You probably taught him how to act, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't all it wasn't all that dramatic, but I was in medical sales in uh, California mm-hmm. and I was in a lab in Los Angeles. I the grew birth rentals in a lab? <laughs> you heard it here <laughs> that, first. <laughs> there there it was. It was in the lab. And as I was walking through the lab, I saw a test tube of blood, and it had the name Burt Reynolds on it. And if I had been, you know, in Chicago or something, I would have said, well, isn't that an interesting coincidence that here's somebody with the the actor's name on Mm -hmm. this little tube of blood? And as I turned around, I bumped into him. He had but he was walking through the lab shirtless. It was (laughs) shirtless. And he was as hairy as as everybody says. And we just bumped into each other. And he was so sweet and so nice and so apologetic that he had bumped into me. We were both saying, I oh, can I'm see so... the sparkle in your eyes I right know. now. Well, I <laughs> he just bumped into shirtless Burt Reynolds? Yeah, Come on. But the funny thing was I had never been a Burt Reynolds fan. He wasn't anyone that I... You know, it, he wasn't all that attractive to me as an actor or whatever. But in person, he was so sweet. And he flashed this beautiful smile, you know, and apologized. And I thought, what a sweetheart, you know, to, to just, he could have just said, oh, you're in my way or whatever. But no, he was just really a, you just adorable at that made moment. contact yeah. with a legendary mustache. Uh, that, it was the contact. Of Bird Reynolds. I mean, it was like a <laughs> nanosecond. But I just, you know, you, you don't forget that kind of smile and sweetness. Oh, he never forgot. Yeah. He never recovered from your he meeting never with did you. He never did. He never, he was never, he was never the he same. He was never the same. <laughs> Uh, in other news, did you guys hear that November the 7th, this coming November, the Prime Minister would officially apologize for the 1939 Canada decision to turn away Jewish refugees? Wait, we haven't apologized for that yet? No, apparently we haven't. This wow. was the MS Lewis was carrying 907 German Jews fleeing the Nazis. At the time, Canada had a, quote, none is too many policy, and... F- 500 of these uh, Jews ended up going back to Germany, and 254 ended up being killed in the war. It was, it was a horrible, horrible thing yeah, to the, have happened. The prime minister said, basically, it was a moral failure for oh, Canada. Oh, it was. And, and for the U.S., too. Uh, well, I didn't ch- check into the U.S., but anyway. That, no, it was it, it was just one of these horrible events, you know, where there, there are refugees were there, and no one would accept them. Exactly. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that Canada is finally getting into the apology, yeah. but... Well, little, that's what we late. do best, isn't it? A <laughs> little late, but better late than, as never. they say, never. Um, in other news, you guys hear that Twitter <laughs> permanently banned Alec Jones. Yes. About time. It made me so happy. <laughs> you know what? The, yeah, he's just going down and down and down, uh, and I hope he's just... He's, uh, I think I, he's just going to faint into a whisper, and that's it. And oh, he'll he'll I, have, I have even more exciting news. I don't know if you know about this. Someone else banned him. Okay. Who? The Apple Store banned his app. Oh, really? Good. Yep. 
<laughs> I had no idea. I didn't, I didn't hear about that. Really? Yeah. yeah. It just happened yesterday. So now only the app is going to be on Android. Yep. Oh man. <laughs> so does he have his own channel or his own? Oh, well, he they have has a website. website. He yeah. has his own website. He tried to go on uh, Vimeo after going on uh, being banned from yeah. YouTube, and Vimeo within like the first day or so basically said, "No, nope, you're done. No, we're not. Yeah. We're not. We're not doing this." So. Seems the entire world is turning their back on oh, crazy yeah. Alex Jones, and it's about That's freaking great. time, if you ask me. Yeah, I'm so curious what my family thinks about this. I haven't asked them yet because <laughs> <laughs> there are fans of his. Uh, did you guys hear that India decided to decriminalize gay sex? Like, yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah, they basically overturned a 157 year old law. Uh, it was rarely used in prosecution, but as of uh, it basically decided to, you know. Not make it an offense to be a homosexual yeah, that's in very India. progressive. That's very, yeah, exactly. As of last year, apparently 70 countries around the world still outlaw the LGBT. So, we'll slowly but surely, there, we're winning. There are some places I cannot visit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, we got to talk about Nike signing oh. uh, Colin Kaepernick. And... <laughs> What a bold move on, on uh, their part. A bold move. Uh, let's let's be honest here, all right? Nike's not developing a huge conscience all of a sudden. They know full well they're doing this as a oh, as a move to tactic. increase their stock, totally. to appeal to the millennials and all that. <laughs> but it's Even the, so, it's a it's a brave move it, to it go is. through the controversy. And, and what's what's funny is um, the reaction from the conservatives. People started burning and cutting their shoes <laughs> and socks. <laughs> And socks and whatever had the Nike logo on it. Like, you guys don't understand boycotts. You don't buy the product and then destroy it. I, I, I heard that apparently the stock in Nike did drop slightly, but then there was a 31% jump in sales. So, so I think Nike go. probably did the right thing there. Oh, yeah. Well, they, this isn't something they would have jumped in without extensively research, like yeah. researching the impact. And they, they definitely went into this knowing that the majority of people that buy their products, which are younger individuals mm -hmm. under the age of like 40, are progressive and like what Colin Kaepernick's protests symbolize. Yes. Okay, so here's, here's a wild question. Do you think that the uptick in in um, Nike mm -hmm. um, uh, favorability because of this is sort of a, um, a precursor of what might happen in the midterms? Mm. Do you think that the 31%, is it 31% that, that they rose? Do you think that that shows that the younger voters, as um, Christina just was talking about do you think that means that there's going to be a wave i, I can i can only hope but just because a young man decide or a young woman decides to buy a pair of shoes to support kaepernick doesn't mean they're going to make the effort to go vote at the vote well i'm just wondering whether or not because they're they're applauding a more progress you know this progressive move yeah. that this means that there are more energized uh, young people who who might vote that's why it's i said it's a wild mm -hmm. kind of thing i just wonder. i think i think it symbolizes that when, yeah. when when corporations are starting to adopt a more progressive mindset yeah. it symbolizes that the mindset is becoming more accepted and henceforth it's going to yield some results uh yeah it's it's a way of saying you know the conservatives are dying and they're dying off and they know yeah. it. um i just want to make a quick clarification though because um you had mentioned that they just signed a deal with him they've actually had him signed thing for like seven years um, like when he was in the NA, uh, NHL or whatever. No, no, no. NFL. NFL, thank you. Um, you can tell I'm in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just they've just made him like the face of a new campaign. Like, yeah. They've yeah. had him signed for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have to actually do an ad. No. They could have just kept that they on nice definitely forever. definitely could have. Right? But I, I definitely appreciate, like, look favorably. I still don't like Nike because, like, children's slavery. Yeah, of course. Not really my thing. But... Seeing companies realize the direction that the world is going in yeah. is not backwards. Yeah. And of course, you know, you got to love the hypocrisy of it all, too, because, you know, these conservatives, you know, burning their shoes and throwing them away. You know, instead of throwing them away your gear, why don't you just give it to one of those homeless I veterans know. you're always so exactly. concerned about? Oh. You know? 
instead of destroying it, why don't you, you know, like, you know, you can shoes yeah. anymore. Well, just go find one of these homeless veterans you, you pretend to care about exactly. and give them your shoes. Well, they, because they don't deal with common they, sense. They, they deal with care. agenda. You know, and when you have an agenda, you know, er, anything that has to do with, you know, improving the real life situations of people, it's a, yeah. Forget about that. That's what I've always said. You know, conservatives yeah. are not. It's it's all the greed and selfishness uh, is really the prime mm-hmm. primary motivation for mm-hmm. somebody who's conservative. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. Or misinform misinformation. Well, it's yeah, yeah. but it's mis it's almost willful mis- misinformation. As soon as they find yeah. out, as soon as it affects them, they become a progressive. All of a sudden, <laughs> it's yeah. really that. You know, if it doesn't affect or, their everyday or life, they don't care. They like progressive things when it. When it helps them, but not other people. Exactly. Exactly. Um, moving on. Uh, did you guys hear that in Alberta, the government announced that they will uh, co- uh, use universal coverage for a new HIV drug. Seriously? Yeah. This drug is actually 99% effective in preventing the disease. Oh, my gosh. It's called PREP, and it's starting October the 1st. This is a daily pill. The generic version actually costs $8.30 per day. Um it's called pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis, and uh, apparently across the country, eighty thousand Canadians are diagnosed with HIV. Now, if you wanted to know the uh, the percentage of that, uh, there's eight point six percent, eight point six diagnosed people per hundred thousand in BC so with how, HIV. So how how do they make the determination? How does a doctor make a determination, or how does an individual make the determination? Yeah, I'm. I think I need to be on this. Well, that's a good question. I don't that's know. a question. <laughs> Cause, Cause, cause yeah. is, is, I mean, is it lifestyle? Is it you know is it vulnerability to you know? Well, to once, once, once you have the disease, so. once you're diagnosed with the disease, the doctor basically makes a recommendation you should be on this medicine. So, does this medication make it so you can't pass on the disease? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I don't have the answer to either, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But is it the person who? Who doesn't have the disease yet, but is considered vulnerable? And is that the person that it, takes it would the seem pill? to be? It oh. would seem to be. Okay, so it's like a prevention. Yeah, well, that's yeah. That's, that's why it says it's ninety nine percent effective in preventing the Got disease. It. So say say you're someone working in like sex work, or yeah. someone like, that. like is someone who is. Somebody who's been maybe hit by a needle and they could be infected, but we're not diagnosed yeah. yet. So let's put you on the. You know, I, I can see medical yeah, me- medical workers who mm-hmm. are. Um, Working like emergency, needle, needle emergency needles. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, 8.6 people per 100,000 in BC are inf- infected mm-hmm. with HIV. Now, if you wanted to know the other provinces, it's 6.6 people in Alberta per 100,000. 15.1 in Saskatchewan. Whoa. Wow. Saskatchewan. Oh. 7.1 in Quebec, 6.1 in Ontario, 5.4 in uh, Manitoba, um, 0.4. Zero point four in uh, New Brunswick. Oh, go New Brunswick! And one point one in Nova Scotia. Hmm. Wow, what going on? You know, this is really <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, that brings up so many questions. That really is a uh, something to follow yeah, over absolutely. the next ten years, five years. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, remember we talked about the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia yeah. and okay. them recalling their students. Well, yeah. what I said was going to happen has happened. A lot of the students have decided not to go back. I don't blame them. And now these students are filing for asylum in Canada. And I I'm hope glad, we give it to them. That's a good thing. I don't that's have the, the number so far, but uh, apparently it's, it's happening more and more. And, of course, last but not least, we <laughs> we got to talk about your buddy Trump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the book that just came out called Fear by the journalist. Uh, was, yeah, it's supposed Woodworth. to, it's supposed to it, hit the shelves it? on the 15th. Okay, because I'm buying something, it when something, it comes yeah. out. Cause I and, want and, to read of it. course, the op letter from the New York Times. Uh, the oh, yeah. The op letter. Op-ed letter. Um, At least wow. there's someone... <laughs> Now, last I heard yesterday, now Donald Trump is asking his staff to look for whoever wrote this letter. Does he not realize it's one you know of his staff? I, you know what I thought of, and I, I kept thinking that one of the news the news analysts were going to say this. The thought that immediately came to mind was Captain Quig and the strawberries, the strawberry incident had to do with the, the cane mutiny. When it was a tyr- tyrannical, it was a book and a movie. Okay, oh, you're looking. I'm puzzled. not familiar so, with oh, it. No. <laughs> well, it had to do with the um, the captain of a of the ship who was Trump like, and anything that happened, he just went over the top. And there were some 
a, a ration of strawberries that were missing from the whatever the allotment was, and he immediately went crazy, you know, over who took those strawberries and and uh, you know just grilled the staff and and treated them, you know, like vermin. It was horrible, but it was sort of the seminal incident that caused the mutiny and then therefore um, the um, the trial wow. uh, of whether or not he was capable of command or not and there were so many but I guess the movie now is is old enough to where most of, most of the news analysts are in their 30s and 40s and they don't <laughs> think of it but it was a great book a wonderful book it's, and a good good movie. It seems to show that what we've been suspecting from the whole time that Donald Trump is essentially this big man child. Yeah. And people are basically yeah. he gives an order, he barks an order and half the half the time people are saying, "Oh no, we're not going to do this." But then he doesn't follow up on Dude, it. Dude, do yeah. you hear that one of the things they papers they hid from him yes. was an order of assassination for a head of state. Yeah. What? Of an, of another country. Yeah, he just wanted to kill them. I'm like, oh th- my god. No, it's, it's, it's a bit like we were talking last week where I was going on this rant about into Donald Trump and doing this this trade war. And he says to Bloomberg, he says, you know, talk about Canadians and Canada. He says, I can't kill those people. I know. It's, it's like, like is, is that, that like an option right off the bat? Do you before? kill people? Or this, I mean, it, it's like, it, it, Obama gave a beautiful speech at the University of Illinois. Oh Urbana, my gosh, yes. Um, and essentially it was, this is not normal. This no, is not the is way, not... you know, government is supposed to function in a democracy. And it, like everyone else, he, you know, made the point that democracy, unless, you know, we do something, which, of course, for him is let's bring the Democrats back to create order, yeah. regardless of who you are. Let's create some order and then sort everything out. But this man is just he. No. he but but the, the Republican Party in enabling him. Yes. It, what's worse, a man who is genetically nuts or a party that is so interested in their own self-serving greed? that they enable him to do all of these things in in order to get Kavanaugh into the Supreme Court and the rest of their agenda. What's worse? Yeah. A, a whole party I, that's I, nuts I think, or I one guy? They, I think they've enabled him, uh, the Republicans enabled him, but now they're also afraid of him now. Yeah. So I think, you know, they're, they're just cowering and that's why they don't speak, you know, because some of them, the gala have to say, no, this is this is ridiculous. In I, a democracy for a party to be afraid of their of the, the president of the United States, there's something very wrong there. Uh, yeah. Worse than wrong. I definitely think this is going to be a black mark on the Republican Party for many Many years. Ago. I hope so. I hope yeah. they re. I hope they reorganize mm-hmm. and become, you know, a, the party that they were. The party of Lincoln. In, in, in the in the fifties and the in the sixties, yeah, yeah. when they had actual liberal moderate. When and when McCain was the average. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, even though I didn't agree with a lot of things well, McCain he, did, he, he was at still... at least could work. At least you could work people. with the man, right? Exactly. Yeah. These, these, so this is gone. This is like, a, I'm, I'm just popping some popcorn and just sitting uh, in front of the TV and watching this. It's like a, it's, it's like a comedy feel, show and a, and a horror drama at the so same time. I just feel so bad for everyone in America right now. Oh. Because they're... Their con- their leaders have been fighting against them for like their the citizens for so long, and they didn't even realize it yeah. because they were people weren't like I just became interested in politics a few years ago, and so a lot of and people in America just assumed oh my leaders are doing good they have my interest in heart, or they just assumed they couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, feel 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 even worse for the women because of Kavanaugh. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, gets to be have, on the Supreme Court. Have you guys court. been watching the um, the hearings? Yes, yep. well, well every, some of it anyway. Every like between ten seconds to like a minute or two, there's protesters standing up. Oh yeah, yelling. Mm-hmm. I'm like, thank you, people. Thank no. you. But his his getting on the Supreme Court is going to be. The, the worst thing that's happened yeah. to women since the 1800s. Like, I don't even know how people can vote for him, like the, the senators, and expect to not be hounded the rest of their life. Yeah. Like every si- single time someone sees you, they are going to scream at you. 
Well, don't you realize, you know, the, the, the red robe and the little white bonnet is great and fashionable for women, just like in a Handmaid's Tale, yeah, right? Yeah, I haven't actually It's exactly what they show. want. Well, it'll be, it'll be fascinating to see what Murkowski and um, what's her, Susan, um, uh, Lisa Murkowski and, and Susan Collins, Collins, Susan Collins, yeah. do. Because really and truly, it's, it's, up, it's up to those yeah. two women. You know, to decide, you yeah. know, are we on, I, the, whose side are we on? Yeah, I don't see how you, how you can be a senator with this, like, in those hearings and hearing him dodge the most simple question yeah. and be like, okay, this is someone I want on the Supreme Court. No, this is... Like, this you have is, to be so corrupt. This is the... So corrupt. The pinnacle of polarization of, of, of... U.S. politics at this point. It's like, you know full well this is not a good person to be there, but because he's on your team, you're going to vote for him anyway. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <sighs> Enough with the depressing <laughs> stuff. My dear Let's Nancy. just keep our fingers crossed for for the blue wave at the midterms. Yeah. We'll see what not that, that I'm biased, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> you got a top difference? Oh, yeah. Yay! <laughs> I sure do. Okay. Let's see. This week... Um, we're going to do the top 10 worst product flops of uh-huh. all time. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah. So I think that's going to be that's that, that's going to be a fun one. This is, you know, there have been some epic ones, and so this top ten is only one list. So if you can think of some others as we as we go along, we can add. Okay. Left in the Valley action figurines were one of those. Well, let's, yeah, let's see. okay, <laughs> number ten according to, to this list, um, which is a website called Think Stock. Um, number ten of the worst product flops was Arch Deluxe from McDonald's. Does anybody remember the Arch, Arch Deluxe? Deluxe? Yes, it was about ten years yes. or so actually, and they it, it was a quarter pounder burger, quarter pounder, quarter pound burger, and it came with lettuce, onions, tomatoes, da 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 da, mayonnaise with a mayonnaise Dijon mustard sauce on a potato bread roll, and the whole idea was to um, have a burger specifically aimed to adults, and and, and so the so the adults could feel better, mm-hmm. and, you know, because they had all the kids stuff and the toys. So this was something supposedly for the adult market. So they spent a hundred million dollars advertising um, on billboards and TV and so forth, and most adults weren't impressed. weren't impressed at all because um, just because the kids didn't want it didn't mean that the adults yeah. did. Mm-hmm. So, but back then, I mean, just interesting for for price in the U.S. back in 1996, it cost two dollars and twenty nine cents compared with the Big Mac, which was a dollar ninety. Uh, a little over 10 years ago or so, that's changed. Anyway, that failure was so monumental that McDonald's completely reversed its strategy of introducing pricier items, and then they had a 55-cent Big Mac and tried other dramatic <laughs> price changes. They're always trying to do something to the market, but I think the Arch Deluxe was was their biggest flop so, so Arch, far. The, uh, when I think of McDonald's failures, I think of the, uh, the Arch Deluxe, of course. Remember the pizza? They had pizza at McDonald's? Remember, Seriously? You guys remember? Yes. I remember hearing I, about it. I yeah. never really went to McDonald's. It was horrible. Yeah. And, of course, the, the, the failure for me to McDonald's the most is um, at some point, they decided to introduce, they had the quarter pounder burger, they had to. They wanted to introduce the third pounder, so it's actually, it's actually a bigger cut of meat because it's one third of a pound instead of a quarter of a pound. Oh. But the average consumer uh-huh. thinking it's a three instead of a four thought the opposite uh-huh. and uh. thought it was a smaller burger. Therefore, it never took off. Are you no, serious? I'm quite serious. To be or, or- Wow, people. <laughs> to be Our fair, side. third pounder does not roll off the tongue like quarter pounder it's does. True. No. It really doesn't. So maybe it's for the best. Anyway, they, stop anyway, it. Okay, again. number nine. Does anybody remember the Newton message pad? Nope. This is going back a while. Yes. It was one of the first products to offer basic computing functions in a little handheld device. It was revolutionary for the time, and everybody was very excited about it. It had a real futuristic look. But it failed to catch on, and it was discontinued. Um, and there was a handwriting feature on it that was extremely unreliable. Yes. But anyway, they um, uh, cut it out, and then they it was replaced by a little paper notebook with a 
I mean, with a, a sort of like a little uh, tailored paper notebook that was actually a, a computer. But Newton message pad, it was an Apple failure. Hmm. It, 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 they even mm-hmm. joke about it on The Simpsons, one of the episodes where they say, uh, take a note on you, Newton, it says, beat up Martin. And he starts scribbling on it, and then the computer writes back, eat up Martha. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, just, so not that just a- it. so not that Apple had had all the failures. Um, in 2006, Microsoft um, had a product called Zoom. And you yes. Remember, you may, yeah, you know all the techie. <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't. It's a little well, before our time, I think. We, I think we're just yeah, too what, young. <laughs> the, yeah, the Zoom. The Zoom was supposed to compete with Apple's iPod, um, but the the, uh, the Zooms froze doing. Due to software glitches, mm-hmm. I mean thousands of them, and so shortly after um, the release, it was really um, uh, proved to be very clumsy and poorly implemented security measures, and uh, most people felt that the Zune wasn't as cool as the iPod. So Microsoft ended up spending nine million bucks on an ad Ooh. campaign. Yeah, and. Uh, it died. This and just never to be brought back. This just shows that when you have science and development and technology, and you innovate into a new product, trying to catch up when the competition tries to catch up, they usually fail. Yeah. So you really should, as a company, you really should invest into something new that yeah. you create from scratch because that pays off. And the iPod and Zoom is exactly that. Yeah. The iPod comes out; it's a huge success. Microsoft tries to catch up, coming out with the Zoom, it fails. <gasps> oh I, my I, gosh. I, I guess my mom. Oh my gosh! Sorry, I just had a flashback to my childhood, and I remember one of those. Uh-oh. Sorry, oh, sorry. I just was like, oh my gosh, I remember holding one, and it was I couldn't get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, whenever whenever you wow, try to, that was fun. <laughs> whenever you try to rush a product to market based on what the competition is yes. doing, it just you know most of the time, you, you, it, regardless of how much money you spent, it's in the it's wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's wrong. Okay, number seven. You guys ought to remember this. You remember New Coke? Remember <laughs> I don't, but yeah, there was uh, there was a citation needed episode on it. <laughs> oh, yes, there yeah, was. Well, aren't, okay. they, aren't they trying again right now? They're trying right now to bring a New Coke Wait, again, really? aren't they? I think they are, but they, they really wanted to reformulate the Coke recipe, um, and they thought it might make, make sense because... Coke's market share was slipping and so forth, so they decided as, again, their competitor Pepsi um, was was successful and they had changed their formula, so Coke made the first recipe change to the original Coke in 99 years. Mm-hmm. They should have thought, you know, there may be something really good about a product that's years of been people buying the long. product. Yeah. But no, they put out the new Coke and immediately stopped the regular Coke. And oh, no. people went crazy. I remember <laughs> it was a backlash that you just wouldn't believe it. I mean, the anger of where's my Coke? Yep. So they they then re-issued um, regular Coke, but they called it classic, classic. Coke. Classic, that's right. Classic, classic. Yeah. Coke. But people were still, come on, Coke, you know, this is, <laughs> this is so stupid. Anyway, um, there was like... It, it took them 77 days to bring back the classic Coke, but they did it. And in that process, the uh, Coca-Cola lost 30 million bucks oh, man. in a new formula. In 77 days. And wow. They, and they spent $4 million on taste testing. So, <laughs> But actually, the Coke weathered it and came back. And, of course, now they have the zero Coke and they have this and that. But... People's taste buds just loved the yep. the regular Coke, and because um, there uh, was cocaine in it. Yeah, <laughs> well, that was way back then. I know. Yeah, but you think of the money that that was spent. Nancy you know, probably invented cocaine. Okay, so here's another food one. I don't know whether the girls are going to remember, you, but you might, Kevin. Do you remember Wow Chips that that came out? Wow this was chips? Um, in the uh, in the early two uh, thousands. Uh, uh, Frito Lay released Wow Chips in an effort uh, to offer healthier and less fattening junk foods. No, thank you. But they <laughs> no. used the fat substitute that had been developed by Procter and Gamble was a product called Olestra, and so they put Olestra in these Wow Chips, and the Olestra had a very unpleasant effect on the body. 
diarrhea, incontinence, Ooh. and cramping. Oh my! No, oh they, no! They put this product out with uh, I have no idea what the research was and how long the research, but the Olestra was just an absolute wow. disaster. <laughs> I, I think I'll keep my junk food at like Ketchup maximum tips. junk. So, oh, so I guess I mean, you, some people actually had to go to the hospital with so, this thing. I can so imagine. when you eat up chips and you end up in the hospital, the in first hospital. thing that comes to your mind is like, wow. <laughs> yeah, so Pepsi, um, which is Frito-Lay, dedicated 35 million bucks to counteract all the negative opinion, but st- sales just went down the, <laughs> the porcelain. Well, yeah, to, because people couldn't eat Along it. with the product. Along with the product, right. So, so then they tried a Wow Chips Light, but at that point the <laughs> brand was just so tainted, contaminated. Um, so they um, they didn't use the Alestra. Finally, they got rid of the Alestra. So and, and they didn't even have a warning label on it at, at the end to try and keep lawsuits away. It was really something. Anyway, that was one of the FDA's biggest blunders of all time to yeah. have, have allowed that. <laughs> yeah. I would love to have like a sample of each of these products' failures, like uh, to collect them. You know, yeah. you got yeah. a chip of a bag of chip of Wow that's yeah. just sitting there. Somewhere. Yeah, in a museum of something. Yeah. And if you, if somebody comes over that you don't like, <laughs> yeah, no, that's because right. then they'd be stuck yeah. in your house. Chip. Yeah. You yeah, offer, be like, hey, you know, I have this extra bag of chips. Take oh. it home. Yeah, <laughs> Number home. five, Coors. Put Uh-oh. out Rocky Mountain sparkling water because they they Coors said that there it was their Rocky Spring Mountain water that made the Coors beer yes. so wonderful. So they decided to put out the water. Big mistake. Um, the the, uh, the bottling logistics and distribution and so forth. The people got confused whether it was a beer, whether it was a water. And, yeah. Um, so think... they used a similar name to that of Coors beer, which confused people. So well, if then, you ever and, drank Coors beer, it's not far from water to be. No, and then Anheuser Busch. <laughs> who makes Budweiser, began criticizing Coors and saying, actually, they, uh, they're they putting regular water in that mountain spring water. Yeah. That kind of, you know, they, they said it was cut with water from Virginia, actually. Ah, <laughs> so then they canceled the bottled water uh, later later on. So that was, <laughs> it, water and beer in advertising don't make, this is a fun one. The, the next one, number four. Uh, Clairol put out a shampoo called Touch of Yogurt Shampoo. That sounds gross. It sounds gross, but you know, <laughs> uh, Procter & Gamble decided that natural ingredients in their product would be a good thing. So it was a back-to-nature movement. So they put okay. in honey, herbs, fruits, and so forth. And so somebody came up with this wonderful idea of let's try yogurt but, <laughs> so but people didn't want yogurt in their shampoo and no. there were actually people that thought they could drink it <gasps> for, i mean uh, don't what? how that happened i you know you just happen to wonder why people would actually taste their shampoo i don't have any in this day and age, i don't question that sort of thing <laughs> so that was it into milk-based hair products and um, so that was I never even knew that they had a touch of yogurt yeah. okay it's number the probiotics three. yeah oh my gosh. number three crystal Pepsi oh I knew that Is was gonna come out stuff with cocaine crystal. in it <laughs> yeah so they spent 40 million bucks on a on a uh, advertising campaign Van Halen had a song that went along with it uh, crystal Pepsi in the in the testing gave it a, a positive outlook Um and then Coca-Cola released Tab Clear to compete mm-hmm. with that. And while the sales for the first year were pretty good, 470 million, most of them were just curiosity. And once people tasted it, they said, no, we don't need it. We want something that looks like regular cola. Kind of like the Coke raspberry. Yeah. So, oh, I haven't tried okay, it number two. Getting up to the up to the top one. Start thinking about what you think was number one. Number two was the touchpad from Hewlett Packard. That was a while ago. That, yeah. Well, actually, uh, that was in 2011, so it wasn't that long ago. Anyway, it was Hewlett Packard's attempt to compete with the iPad, and it had mm. video capability, processing speed, yada yada yada. And they thought really it was going to give Apple a run for its money. But it was a colossal failure and discontinued almost 
It, the, it came out and, and left almost immediately. Wow. And because of that failure, HP wrote off, listen to this one, $885 million oh. bucks in assets wow. and an additional $755 million in cost to wind down the operating system. And so That's it insane. failed, Ouch. they lost money. Somebody got fired over that for sure. Yeah, <laughs> HP has continued to struggle to maintain an edge, and uh, now it's kind of in a multi-year turnaround. But um, I never saw. Do you remember the touchpad? No, I don't. It I mean, it was about. it was it was in 2011. It's not that far off. Yeah, not that far off. Mm-hmm. Okie dokie. Any idea I of no what idea. the number one as of as of now? The number absolute one. You're not. The girls aren't going to remember it unless they read about it. I was about it. to say the Floby. No, I'm just kidding. No. I have no idea. The, oh gosh, I, that was the that was. I remember commercials on that Floby. <laughs> they were so funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was like the, a vacuum cleaner. The Floby is it was, a, it was a, a vacuum cleaner that was supposed to cut your hair. Cut your hair. What? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you would suck your hair up and cut it at the same time. Supposedly <laughs> that you could do it at home and yeah. make it an even cut better uh, than. No. Uh, but, oh, that's not how you cut your no, hair. No, that's not it how you're cutting your hair. The idea is actually not bad. Getting your hair to stick straight up yeah. because of the suction of the vacuum. Well, that might work for no. men. Well, I understand that, but but, but the principle yeah, itself is not if you want to have, like, layers, you need, like... Yes. That, actually, that wow. probably was a success for a while. Anyway, number one on our little hit parade today, anybody remember the Edsel? The what? what? Automobile. See, nobody's going to yes. remember. Yes, you remember? Yes. Very, yes. I remember Edsel hearing the name. Edsel was named after Edsel Ford, and who was the, the, the former president. It was a three-wheeler. And Ford's only son. Wait, a and car? It, yes. It was a car. Three and it, wheels. Ford put Terrifying. it out. It cost them 350 million bucks, which in today's dollars would be like 2.9 million. They promoted no, bi- it billion? aggressively with ads and they probably went a little bit too far because people were expecting more than the car was because they had a teletouch push button transmission electronic controls and all that was revolutionary unfortunately they didn't work (laughs) and they were but they were erratic when they worked so people back in those days and this is um in the the, um, um 19 let me see when did when did it come out early early uh, 70s I think oh I'm sorry 1957 this really goes back oh I'm wow sorry. yeah this goes back ago. so the Edsel came out and um, it, it, it was like 2500 bucks for the Edsel Pacer which was a four door sedan and then they also had a two door convertible oh it's and that it, was, about. it was an ugly car one of the things I think that people objected to that wasn't in this article was that the grill in the front instead of being uh, horizontal it was vertical it was vertical and they had this horrible looking vertical thing, and people thought it was ugly and they, um, they they just wouldn't buy it. Now, if you've got one, it's a, there aren't that many left, I don't think. I think there may be a oh, couple it's of cars. Sure. Yeah, but the Edsel, I mean, that, such an unfortunate name yeah. for this guy. And it, it's and not it the one I had in mind. There was another car, like a mini car, but it was a three-wheeler. Oh, yeah. We tried to bring to, to, to North That's America right. from Europe, and it, it, it failed miserably as well. But it's... Yeah. I remember, That's not the one I was thinking. What, what you have something. to think, as, after I I read this and, and went through it, you have to wonder. You've got these corporate, you have these these corporations that supposedly hire the best people that they can, the best engineers, the best PR, the best um, um, you know of, of everything, mm-hmm. designers. How can they go so hor- horribly wrong in terms of the product, testing the market? understanding what it is that consumers need. I mean, the millions and millions of dollars to spend on a mistake, you just wonder, you know. Maybe they're not asking what the consumers want. Maybe they used to work for Donald Trump. The best people. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, I'm I'm sure that there... Anybody think other than the Floby? Anything come to mind? uh, It wasn't in the article? Yeah, there's some interesting products in that way. I mean, uh, for, if we're going to stick with cars, for example, the uh, uh, DeLorean. Yeah. The DeLorean. Ah, uh, the DeLorean. As well, you know. Yeah. 
fantastic looking car, but not a great car, actually. I've seen the DeLorean. The DeLorean's fantastic. Well, they look great, but I mean, yeah. as a car, it actually wasn't that great at all. So, yeah. But There's products, a lot of things yeah, like that. Products come and go so fast now, and it's hard to. 3D to find TVs. Yes, there the 3D TV with the glasses. Yep. Right? My mom nobody has one. Wanted to put the, nobody wanted yeah, to buy 3D. glasses to want 3D yeah. TV, yeah. Well, no, you just take them from the movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> they work at home. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. I think I'd rather have, like, one of the 4K Ultra. Oh, those things are amazing. The rounded ones? Oh, gorgeous. I'd even do without the rounded one. Because remember when we sat there in front in the store and just, like, watching one. it? Like, huh. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's time for us to move on. Yeah? Probably. To another brilliant moment, brought to you by religion. All right, so here's a twist on the atheist adopts the highway genre. Colleen Adams, an atheist from California, noticed a sign reading Psalm 24 along the highway and decided she also wanted to adopt a highway. That traditionally means promising to pick up trash along a stretch of road a few times a year. In return, the city will put up signs for your, with your group's name on it. The only problem was, she didn't have a group that could apply for the program. And she was also bothered by the fact that she couldn't find a group by the name of Psalm 24. So it appeared to her like a form of Christian privilege. So she created her own business for the sole purpose of being able to clean the road. <laughs> she called it the Art of Satan. <laughs> oh my she applied gosh. for a business license from the state and received it two months later, and then she immediately filled out the paperwork for the program. It worked. I like her. <laughs> now, if you're driving along the I-5 between the Knighton Road and Bonnie View exits, you should sure th you should be sure to thank Satan along the way. Adam ex Adams explained that the gallery isn't actually rooted in Satanism or any religion. Art of Satan is a business not directly affiliated with any religion, said Adams. I do not believe in God. I do not believe in Satan. Adams told a local news station that one of the signs has already been vandalized. Someone used red spray paint over the word Satan, but Caltrans cleaned it up for her. They've also been informing complainers about how the First Amendment works. <laughs> Incidentally, Adams plans to open up an actual business with the name in which she sells artwork online. But make no mistake, that's not the primary mission of this business. <laughs> this is a bit like the sweet Jesus guys with the ice cream. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Although, can't, you can't help but think that, you know, with a name like that, she should be cleaning Route 66. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That would be amazing. You know, it's, it's really, when you think about it, it's just, it's, it, it's really something where you have a Christian group who, who gets their church vandalized, who gets signs vandalized. You know, it's criminal, it's criminal, we've got to do something. You have an atheist group that puts up something and a sign gets vandalized and everybody says, serves them right. Yeah, yeah, I yeah mean, exactly. You know, hello, this is... The hypocrisy is the first still a thing. amendment here. I just, I thought that was just such a fun little story. It, it is a fun story. made me happy. Yeah, it's a fun story. I wonder right. if we did that here in BC, what would happen? Yeah, I don't think people care that much. Well, we Maybe in Abbotsford. But... Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. A couple of weeks ago, Hurricane Lane was a Category 4 storm heading straight for Hawaii. Somebody called Cat Kerr. But before it hit land, it significantly weakened and ended up doing far less damage than many experts predicted. There was heavy rain, which left behind a lot of damage, but it certainly could have been worse. So can anybody tell me, why did the hurricane weaken? Prayer. I think it had to be Cat Kerr in a swishy our, state, right? It favorite. was the one and only Cat Kerr. <laughs> she knows why. It's because her prayers shredded the hurricane. I believe uh, it. Yes. I believe it. I Somebody now, can take out the lunchbox. I have my little. I have my lunchbox. So if bad weather comes to Abbotsford, all I have to do is wave the. In its, you know, yep. Yep. She explained it in her video. We dealt severely with the one in Hawaii. We're still trying to... They're still trying to figure that out. They're going to do a week... Do week-long researches on all the past videos. They've got to figure out what in the world happened to that storm. I'll tell you what. It became nothing. And that's exactly what we said. You will become nothing. You will not hit land. You will not do devastation to the land of Hawaii. And the people will be free from that. 
And then we hit it and whacked it away. Guess what? It all happened because we made decorations and decrees because of our authority in Jesus Christ. And it all happened. And it happened quickly because they had these dire projections of this Category 4 or 5 hitting Hawaii and doing great devastation. And they all went to bed. They woke up the next morning and it was in pieces. They're still trying to, they're so undone by this. Like, what happened? And one of the meteorologists said, never in the history of meteorology, that's the study of weather, okay, and atmospheric conditions, never in the history of meteorology have they ever had that happen to a hurricane. You go, swishy lady. Well, hold on a sec. She said that? She said She that. said that the somebody... Uh, 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 oh, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> I hope she's on duty she, now. She's yeah, she's picking up poison from Donald Trump there. Yeah, okay. Nothing she'll have nothing but the best swisher stick. Yeah, oh what, yes. What is the one that's that's heading for Florida now? That's Oh that's a good question. Yeah, there's one there's one coming. Senator so Japan. I'm I'm Plenty sure they're on here. I'm sure they're on alert. <laughs> Needless to say, if she wants credit for destroying the hurricane, then I guess she's responsible for the millions of dollars in damages and at least one death that have occurred because of the still powerful tropical storm. Not that she'll ever admit to that. Mm. Only in Jesus' world do people celebrate and take credit for a weakened hurricane without considering why God didn't just stop the hurricane from appearing at all. How delusional do you have to be to take credit for something that a storm does naturally anyway? A storm forms, it picks up speed, it picks up strength, it dissipates. comes over land, and dissipates. That's what yep. the, that's a pattern for every freaking storm since the beginning of the creation of this planet. She's the standard but for delusion. Yeah. Somehow, Sushi Lady thinks that it's her, her do that. Yep. Well, this is the same woman, after all, who once attempted to beat back Hurricane Irma with a literal scepter, then, after seeing all the damage caused by Irma, blamed everyone else for not following her lead. God only seems to listen to her when she likes the results after the fact. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I know. <laughs> swishy lady. I know. She just she fills <sighs> our lives with such joy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you, Cat Kerr. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don't know what we would do without her. Uh, Be a much right. more boring life. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much person for this so let's take a very pause welcome. and when we come back we'll be talking to jessica the therapist so stay with us in a world torn apart by a lack of reason or and I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. In the morning. Hi, everybody. This is Robert Stanley from the Right to Reason podcast. And if you subscribe now, you'll get free. Learn more about the broadcast at therighttoreason.com. It's time for an AtheistAudiobooks.com sneak preview. The happy atheist disproving Christianity after faith the constitution in God. Baptized atheist. The God virus. Here is an excerpt from The Good News Club. The Christian Rights Stealth Assault on America's Children by Catherine Stewart. This book had its beginnings in one of those events that at first seems too small to matter until suddenly it becomes too big to ignore. When a program called The Good News Club showed up on a roster of after-school activities at my daughter's public elementary school in Santa Barbara, California, I didn't give it much thought. The club advertised itself as a non-denominational Bible study program for children of kindergarten age and older, and it required parental consent for children to participate. I soon found out, however, that the Good News Club is very different from what it appears to be. More importantly, I discovered that the club is really just one small part of a much larger story that should be of concern to anyone who cares about the future of public education or indeed the future of secular democracy in the United States. 
The Good News Club. The Christian Rights Stealth Assault on America's Children is now available on AtheistAudiobooks.com. All right, so joining us online is our friend Jessica Turwheel. She's a licensed mental health care psychologist, so she can certainly deal with us. She started her career as a child and youth psychologist with the National Child Protective Services and moved on to work for 20 years as a licensed forensic psychologist. She's a snappy dresser and a snazzy dancer. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us at Left of the Valley. <laughs> thank you very much. Pleased to be here. The pleasure is all ours. Now, this is a funny story because Jessica happens to be one of the listeners of the show. And uh, several shows ago, she basically had a bit of a, uh, a problem with something I said. And she sent <laughs> us a letter. She, my, of course. <laughs> it had to be something I said, obviously. And she sent us a letter saying, you know, I don't quite agree with your point here. And she made it. She actually made a very good point. And uh, we kind of, re- well, didn't quite recant, but we kind of clarified the point on a later show. And we've been friends ever since. And now she's on the show <laughs> talking to us about her work. <laughs> Uh, Jessica, you know, uh, thank you so much for being on the show, and maybe you'd be so kind to give us a short bio as to uh, what you do or what you did. Um, what I did? Well, I worked as um, in two two fields actually: uh, therapy, mm-hmm. psychotherapy, just what everybody imagines uh, it to be. That's what I did, and I still do that. And for twenty years, I've been a forensic psychologist, which means treatment and diagnosis with the criminally insane. So she can totally take care of us. We're we're right where we should be with the person that can deal with us in the best possible way. I feel so comfortable. <laughs> Nancy, Nancy's an assassin for hire. Is there something we can you could give us some some tips as to not enrage her? A couple shows ago, she really beat the crap out of me. <laughs> Well, but then Kevin has the delusion that I've been around for 5,000 years, so delusion. deal with that one. I have evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, t- today I, I want to focus uh, uh, on, on something that you, you, it, I guess is right up your alley, um, de-escalation when it comes to conflict resolution. Uh, I think a lot of people in life get into fights, and you see that especially more pronounced on things like social media, because you know on social media everybody's anonymous, and it's very easy to get into fights, discussions, and spats, and to have it climb really quickly. But I think it's also a, a, a very good skill for people or, or listeners to learn from the expert like yourself about de-escalating the situation. So in your professional opinion, how, how would you go about doing something like that? Oh, wow. Okay. That's a big question. Um, Yes, it's a very. <laughs> we 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 would have to select um, a typical situation or something to uh, narrow it down a little bit. Um, so let me just tell you what I work with mostly. I work with people who struggle with loved ones whom with whom they get into fights, like uh, family situations, uh, quarrels between spouses, and um, difficulties in in raising the kids and in getting the kids to stop fighting and stuff like that so is that okay yeah, of if, course, if i tell you a bit because i i think most people if not all people struggle with that in at some point in their lives uh, or they have fights with their in-laws or with their parents or with their siblings or with their loved ones basically um so what we, oh dear should, where, should, where do i begin should we give her a specific situation uh, i'm bad um, coming up stuff <laughs> I, the, the basic thing that happens when people get into a fight is they, for for just one second, they forget to reflect on how they come across. That base, that's the the main thing that goes wrong when you forget how you come across. And you see that on Twitter all the time. People just put something out and they have no idea how it comes across, and they just want it out there. And and that's usually how people start a fight and uh, yeah it's it's an impulse we call it an impulse and technically it's a lack of self-control is there a, I, I guess especially if you're talking about social media for when you're texting something tone is not included in your conversation and of course no. you know body language and tone you can't see that so uh, uh, you can misinterpret whatever is written there very very quickly so totally so, so what something that you you were saying a minute ago when you were saying that people don't always know what they're you know what they're putting out there so are, are, are that would 
tend uh, to to believe. Well, let me start all over again. <laughs> uh, let's start rationally. So then, there are two kinds of of um, uh, things that people do, intentional and non-intentional. So someone can put something out that they intend to be controversial or to be aggressive, but there are those, those people who also say something who are totally clueless that um, it's going to be taken the wrong way. So then in de-escalation and what you do are those two totally different um, situations that are, are dealt with in different ways? Yes, it's it's funny that you ask because no, um, those are different situations and on the internet the first category is usually a troll uh -huh. and the second category they, they are honest and sincere, they want something um, they want something in the situation or they want their lives to go in a certain direction and they feel that there is an obstacle in, in the shape of what you just put out there or, or whatever. But um, generally speaking, those de-escalations are always about the same thing, which is calming down. Um, usually people can deal with any type of conflict, any type of disagreement, as long as they remain really calm when communicating. And that is the hardest part. So, um, so about coming, can I go on? Yeah, about no, coming sorry, down, sorry because it, it's so crucial. If if you feel um, some sense of urgency, um, you're probably about to do something that is not entirely the most clever thing to do. Um, and um, whereas you have probably been in that situation where you it's it's been a week and you finally get to sit down and to talk about what happened last Saturday and because it's already a week ago you're really calm and you can just say look I just it, it just you mean th this is what happened to me and I'm sorry I said it that way but really it's just not my cup of tea you know that about me and then uh, if as soon as you can Put it in those words with this calm tone of voice without getting all frantic and hectic. It works. It works, right? So de-escalation is all about um, calming down. And that's where we have our biggest problem in, in calming down. So um, one of the most interesting techniques for de-escalation is um, the, uh, the, the, the principle, to apply the principle that anyone who needs to calm down needs to do it by themselves. Now, this sounds very simple, like if, if you're the frantic one, then you're the one who should be coming down, right? If I'm the frantic one, it should be me that's coming down. But it's not that obvious. People tend to... Um, to go do stuff when they want the other person to have a different emotion or to have less emotion or to become less angry, etc. We, we tend to interfere with other people. We tend to start communicating, to, to start doing stuff when we see another person having some strong emotion. Uh, but the, the great big trick of uh, de-escalation is that everyone should do their own calming down. They should do it by themselves and they preferably they should be alone when they calm themselves down. No, no, Jessica, I, 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 I got to push back on this because, you know, <laughs> any man out there will tell you, you never go to your spouse, your girlfriend, your wife, and tell her to calm down. That's <laughs> that's, that's a sure way to end up in a doghouse. So, yes. So how, how when you see somebody that's getting into a volatile situation, their, their emotions are high and stuff like that, you can't really go to them and tell them to calm down. No, but that's not what we do. But we do want them to calm down. But we engage in some interaction. We start to, we we start telling them. Uh, we, we we offer consolation, or we offer some sort of excuse or apology or whatever it is. But we we start to interact, hoping that they will get into a different state, that they will change their, the, you know, that, that something will change in the way they're acting or being or or, or doing or perceiving things, and it it, it is a problem. It is a problem. Uh, uh, the, if the very best way to get to a de-escalation is when uh, when people can signal to each other or, or at least notice uh, for themselves that they are actually at this very moment not really suitable to be in, in anybody's company, that they should really just first sort their emotions out, uh, breathe again, think it over, and think about what to say, pick the right thing to say, and then come back and talk about it. 
it, it's often so difficult when you when your emotions are rising and you begin to feel either defensive or frustrated about what the other person is saying how, I, I, what are the what are some of the techniques or what are some of the things that you can do when you're at that peak emotion and trying to defend yourself or you feel that you're cornered to get to the point where you can say i'm going to take a deep breath now or i'm i'm listening to what you say and i'm not going to take it personally that's that's so difficult. How does one reach that point that they can deal more with with rationality and calmness than than peak emotion? Yes, it is. It's it's very hard work, and we all make mistakes all the time. I I have been working on this in my own private life for uh, many years now, and I still uh, don't really do it that well uh, all the time. Um, but the, the the key the key is uh, when you feel when you sense that you're not going to be good company that you do not have it all really well together that you are going to open your mouth and let some stuff come out that you might regret or that's not really well directed uh, just go away shut up go away calm down become coherent and become good company. Um, when I work with couples in, in, in couples therapy and also with uh, families where there's usually a lot of uh, also violence going on between parents and children or uh, amongst siblings, um, the first thing, the first rule that we install is if you cannot be good company, you should remove yourself from the living room. Just go away. Become good company, and then you can talk about it, because then you're calm, you're rational, you, you can take your time, you have thought about how to say this. Um, do not try to be anybody's company if you are not suitable for company. Okay, I've got so many questions about all this. <laughs> my mind's going like a, a thousand and, different places. And then here. there's me and Kirsten, like, oh my gosh, hey, this is yeah. what we do. <laughs> 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 okay, so um, uh, I'm, I'm going to go into just one. Uh, like, like I said, so many uh, directions here. Um, so, <laughs> for example, counseling for Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> this is therapy session for Kevin for sure. <laughs> Welcome to my couch. Uh, so, so for, for example, okay, Nancy's about to kill me, and she is she, she's in a very volatile situation here, um, and I, I need her to calm down. I can't tell her to calm down because she's got her knife and she's going to stab me again. Well, I think that's when you call 911. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is there... Since communication is... Body language is a huge part of communication. Is there a physical way or I can adopt to send a message across? For that uh, she probably needs to not, calm down? because if she's not sort of worth a company, she's not going to register everything, maybe. Uh, you never know. But so I mean, if, 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 if she doesn't uh, remove herself to calm down by herself, then maybe you should just, you know, scarp her. <laughs> oh, okay. I can't, I can't fight her. She's got that kung fu grip. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm thinking, for example, if she, she's in the chair, and if I, if I kind of lean over her, I'm taller than her, and, you know, that, that's an aggressive yep. posture, and she's yep. not likely to listen. But if I crouch down on the ground and yes. tell her that she needs to calm down, that body posture is much more... Um, but but the thing is, you're trying to influence her state of mind. You're trying to influence her emotional state. You're trying to be an influence in her life that will calm her down. Now, there is a huge problem with that, even though it doesn't seem to be a huge problem, but there is a huge problem with that. Um, if we keep doing that all the time, then first of all, we never really experience uh, what it takes or h how it works to calm ourselves down because we never get to do it by ourselves and uh, so that it has some there is something that weakens us there and also we, we come to think that we really need to be interacting in order to calm down we really need that other person and you begin to think that she really needs you because she won't be coherent if you don't influence her right now no 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 no. So don't just don't her. interact when you're not suitable for interaction. Just don't do it. But I, but it's, it's somebody who's <laughs> like a type A personality, somebody who's very dominant, they they're not likely to walk away from a confrontation. They're just likely to try yep. to dominate and say, okay, I'm not suitable for now. I got to walk away. They're not likely to do that. They're likely to more to charge ahead and make sure to dominate everybody else. Yes. How how, they how, are. how do you get somebody like that without manipulating them? To walk away. 
uh, based on the results that they get. I, I in in uh, usually I have uh, clients for aggression problems who are some sort of type A personality. By the way, they are usually cluster B personalities, okay. <laughs> technically speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, yes, they just they pounce, they pounce on stuff, and then they they snap and they yell and they insult and they accuse and they do all kinds of things. And the only way in which they can uh, learn to not do that anymore is through results. I tell them they will have results. And um, if they don't test it, they won't discover the results. And they do discover the results. I've worked with parents who have had parents with uh, autistic children, for example, who have tried everything for 18 years and uh, their son is like 18 years old and still having these screaming fits in the living room uh, where everybody wants to hide. Um, the, the the principle of not engaging ever anybody with anybody when there is someone who is not suitable for company, it works a treat. In, in six months, it's over. It's done. People go away. They come down and they come back and they say something in a coherent tone of voice. And it makes sense what they say. So And it's done in five minutes. So So let's do a scenario here. Let's say I'm that type A personality. I'm big. I'm aggressive. I'm angry. And the girls are here, and I'm pounding my chest. You know, I'm doing my whole gorilla thing, and there's yep. no reasoning with me. They can't tell me to walk away. They can tell me to walk away. Yeah, they can't. That would be interacting we, with that's you. That's when we so walk they away. better leave yeah. themselves. So they yeah, have yeah, to yeah, yeah. Leave. The, the aggressive person who doesn't go away dominates the living room, but they're very lonely in the living room, and the rest of the house doesn't want to be there. That was great advice. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, if I understand you, it's focusing on uh, on yourself and how you are um, respond. So, so, so you're not interacting, but you're doing what is is best for for you, uh, rather than trying to do anything to affect the other person's behavior. It's only your behavior that you're concentrating on, which is I'm taking my deep breath, I'm doing such and such, so that you don't engage. And you think that by doing that, that the other person, you know, will learn to de-escalate because they're not getting any rewards through my through through my behavior? That's a very, very good one. Yes, of course, that's, there's that too. If, if people begin to behave abominably and we engage with them, it's like we're rewarding that behavior, right? Suppose Kevin does what he just described and he becomes the, the King Kong in the room. <laughs> um, if, if we engage with him, it's, it's rewarding. He gets our full attention. You know, we, we will all start to interact with him and, and, and talk about the stuff that he's, he's bringing up. Why? Why would we want to reward such behavior? Why wouldn't we just go away and say, look, we're going to have a coffee and have a nice time. Goodbye for now. Yeah. Because hmm. even uh, negative oh. attention is still attention. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. If, if oh, yes. Negative chest, attention is very rewarding yeah. because usually it's at least 100%. Yeah. Or more. That's very it's very it, rewarding. If Do not ever underestimate negative attention. And we're trying to get you to stop. You're getting attention. So you're like, oh, I can do this and get attention. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's it's how you drag everybody in the room through whatever mud you're creating by, by spouting the angry things that yeah. you're spouting. No. Why would they? Why? I mean, if you want, let's look at it from the other side, because there is a, a psychological logic to this that is um, that I, I really like. If you want, you, you get angry because something is just not um, it, it's not where your standards tell you it should be, mm -hmm. right? That's when you get angry. You're frustrated about it, or it's, it's disappointing, or it's, it's just very, very wrong. So you want some higher standard for something there. You want it, it, it has to be of a higher level. How do you think you're going to accomplish that if you lower your standards for your own behavior? What are you contributing to this higher standard if you start yelling and screaming and King Konging all over the place? Oh, that's like reverse psychology. I like it. <laughs> uh -huh. oh. There is a true psychological logic to it. So if you want a higher standard, then work on your own methods to get there, which would be calming down, being rational, thinking of the, the, the nice thing of taking your time of uh, what we call the secondary reaction, not the primary reaction, which is the impulse. The secondary reaction is you take your time. 
I always tell uh, these, these, these easily, the, the hotheads, we call them, um, I always tell them, look, if it is really that important, tomorrow it will still be that important. Mm. What's more, next week it will still be that important. So you've got, you've got so much time. You don't need to do it now. Mm, I like that. So, you, so you, can, you have the time to think about it and to go over uh, various options. And then you can pick the best option. And that's where you put some quality of your own into whatever it is you're striving for, whatever you want, you know, uh, to get to on a better level. Hmm. Well, so, that's, that's way better than a usual method because you <laughs> usually just said Nancy and she just throws the person off the balcony. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the easy way to do it. But, you know, I like your way too. So I was going to ask, for people who are the the person that's in that agitated state that is wanting to calm down and they know they have to separate themselves, would you recommend they, like, when, before they get to that spot, while they're rational and thinking of the future when that will happen, would you suggest they find places they can go, things that they can do to calm themselves down, kind of like a plan to set out for themselves? Yes. Before they're even in that situation? <clears throat> yes, totally. Because many, many people have no idea. When I ask them, how do you calm yourself down? They have no idea. They cannot tell me. Because usually they go on interacting and interacting until they're exhausted. And then they think that the interaction has calmed them down. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we go over all the different options. You can you, you know, just uh, do some Netflix binging. If yep. it calms you down, you can take a shower, go for a walk, do some sports, uh, uh, cry in your pillow um, well whatever comes you down really but yes we, we, we go into that a lot because people need to teach themselves to do this job yeah to get themselves into a useful state again okay I, 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 I gotta intervene in this here because <laughs> that to me I, although I agree with everything you're saying so far but that to me implies that the person that's having the issue is somebody that can sort of reason properly about something. Um, what happens when you have a person that is our dead set thinking that they are correct about a point? Um, I used to say I used to say that you know being correct about something is probably the greatest feeling you have and experience as a person. Invertedly, being wrong about something is a very devastating feeling, and I think a lot of people avoid that feeling by just stubbornly sting on a point even though they know they're wrong because they don't want to lose face now if you have a yep. situation like that that Kevin's being the gorilla he's obviously wrong about a point but he doesn't want to back down how do you get Kevin to calm down well we don't if Kevin doesn't do it by himself then we just remove ourselves from this horrible presence of his we just don't you want to be insufferable company, you're not going to have any company if it depends on me. So in, it just in, doesn't work. In, in a case like that, and, and Kevin and I are, are having that conversation, and I'm beginning to feel hot and intimidated by him, yep. would it be okay for me to say, Kevin, I, I, I'm having difficulty trying to process this conversation and I'm not feeling good about it so I'm going to have to stop for now and and when I feel I can continue this conversation with you and and we're both maybe a little calmer I'd be glad to but right now I have to I have to I have to pull back because I'm I'm just at, at a point where I can't think rationally would that be something I could say to him yes Yes, 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 yes. If you feel your quality is not really, you know, it, it's going down, you're, you're not processing it correctly, you, you're struggling to, you know, it, it just doesn't feel right, take your time. If it's important today, it will still be important tomorrow. If tomorrow you find out that it is not important, then maybe it was just, the, you know, the hectic moment or um, it, the hormones or whatever it was, and, and you, you can regroup. But always regroup first. Yeah. And so once I say that, I'm taking responsibility for me and for how I feel in that interaction. And hopefully by doing that, that it will de-escalate Kevin and, and maybe he will begin to, to think about how his behavior is affecting other people. 
it might totally if if he doesn't have you to interact with and 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 to be all gorilla with then he has only his own company and he will have to deal with a gorilla and 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 he can see where it takes him you know so far i sound like a real asshole don't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, at was, least at least we can you, you thought this, of the gorilla this yeah. is a, a purely hypothetical situation yes <laughs> yes it's purely hypothetical. So, <laughs> so what, what other things might I say to Kevin if I'm not if I'm not a, a, as evolved in my emotions to be able to articulate my discomfort? Are there some other things that that might work? You know, at at the beginning until I get to the point that I can articulate my my discomfort and uh, with with the interaction that's occurring. I'm not sure I understand the question. I, I think what I'm trying to say is it would be nice if I had that much responsibility to be able to de-escalate by focusing on, on my behavior and my feelings. But if I can't quite do that, are there any things that you teach people to to say or or to do um, specifically that 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 help bring about um, the, the, the de-escalation. Um, am, am I still confusing you? <laughs> no, but I'm not sure that um, you're still hoping to get some de-escalation from okay. the interaction. Okay. Um, that's just not the optimal uh, uh, route I, I, to take. I guess maybe what I'm saying is instead of going into I feel uncomfortable and so forth and so on, would it, would it be just as valid to say I need to take a breath now? Yeah, sure, okay. of course. That, that's Any, what I'm saying. Are there, there's yes. some, are there certain key key things to say until you you know get to, get to the point that that you can you can handle uh, an, an, an intimidating person? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, there there are tons of different ways. There are couples uh, where both partners know that one of them is uh, easily uh, intimidating and, and snarling and growling, Excellent. and they they uh, make a deal and they say, when I give you the time out signal, you know that it's becoming too much for me and we need to. Uh, stay in separate rooms for half an hour and see if we can regroup Um, anything really as long as it works for you and the person that you're with so so saying just time out it would 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 might be an effective technique to to use at that point yeah yeah it it depends on on the person some people know that they will when 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 the switch is flipped inside their head that they will just not understand a thing anymore and their partner uh, just needs to leave. Mm-hmm. When oh. they just make the deal, I, when I see you leave, that's where I will realize, okay, this my partner doesn't want to communicate with me at this point. I will have to think for myself now. And, and other people can still communicate. I've worked with parents with um, difficult children who decided to leave while physically still in the room they would just tell their child look my ears are so full i'm not going to hear you for a couple of minutes because i need to to sit here and meditate and they would just not listen and not react to the child that was a way of leaving that they invented and i i was i i I doubted that it would work but they invented this uh, themselves and it worked a treat worked just fine because it was a family deal that that's how they did it Mm -hmm. So you, what you really have to do is you kind of have to find what works for you as like in an individual person. Yeah, of course, everybody is different. Some some people, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you you you've all you've seen it on TV. You maybe you have, you have met him in person. Some people need the the fire brigade to bring out the hose to calm them down. <laughs> Other people, you can just wink at them or make this time timeout signal, and they go like, oh oh yeah, you're you're right. You know, and anything in between. I, I love where this conversation is going because this also exposes the difference between interacting in person with a person and doing something like social media. Because, for example, Jessica here is basically saying, if control yourself, don't reward people by engaging when their uh, behavior is unacceptable, and isolate and regroup yourself when you're the one that figures out you, you're having a problem. But when you do something like that on social media, the... Uh, for, for lack of a better word, the opponent will claim victory, will claim weakness, and that's that's. I guess that's why social media can be so enraging, because it draws us back in to keep on confronting. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, 
It, it, it totally does. And it's very hard to put real quality into your own output on social media. And, and it's hard to give other people time to put some quality into their response, especially on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, face, Facebook is better, you know, you, you, you can, it, it's easier. Hold on. You have there. more room for text and variations. Just, just like, have you not noticed the President of the United States? He's a, he's a paragon of stability. <laughs> he's on Twitter all the time. But- I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Too, too much. Would be too much work. Yeah. Um, just to jump in here, I know we've talked about, um, like, in, our, in your personal life, like, with, you know, loved ones and that. And we've talked about on social media, but one thing for when we're talking about the de-escalation and keeping yourself calm, I'm that... What about in a situation where you might be, say, in a workplace and dealing with a customer? What are some things you might suggest for that? For if you have, say, a customer comes in and they're like, I want to return this product and they're just being very uncooperative and unruly and it's not necessarily a situation as an employee you can just walk away from? Could you you tag someone else in? Like, yes. Well, there there are some obvious uh, procedures there. Um, obviously, if if the customer is really not uh, not being okay, then you you call the security or yeah. you tell them to leave or you or else you will call somebody you know some authority. Um, and there is this is very interesting. But you bring me to another point. When when you have to. Uh, sort out a disagreement there are a couple of um, uh, conversational techniques and, and we, we we tend to apply the wrong techniques so one thing that you will see most people do when they have to deal with difficult customers is they just repeat one important point and that's all they do they 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 don't get sidetracked no goal posts going all over the place no they have one point and they repeat the point until the customer says yeah 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 I hear that because that's where they have a connection again and that is a crucial technique when you are sorting out a difference and many many people um, get into the goal post problem because they start explaining and they start you know they, they start giving all kinds of extra information and examples and, 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 and whatnot, and it becomes this huge thing in quarrels also. It's the same thing happens. It becomes this enormous thing, and you're quarreling until 2, 3 in the morning, and the next day you wonder, have we said anything that was of any relevance? Yeah. But probably not. It's just the, 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 the enormous goalpost game. So the, the, this, one, this one thing that you pick that you find really important, just repeat that until you have a connection again. At some point, you will have a connection. They will say, I hear you. Okay, thank you. You know, Kirsten, I have to point out, okay, first of all, I think that's very personal what you just did there. I just returned that toilet scrubber because I thought it was a back scratcher. Ah. You didn't have to put this in there, okay? People don't need to know this. Ah. Well, I didn't bring your name into it, Kevin. Uh, I thought we weren't doing this kind of things on the show. Um, so in situations where you are with a loved one and you you've separated yourselves how important is it after you've you've one or both of you have calmed down like i don't know if only one person needed to calm down but when everyone is rational how important is it then to go back to the conversation and talk about what happened um it it always is because um you 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 split up for uh for a while uh, on the basis of something negative and you, you, you do need a little bit of closure. Mm-hmm. And uh, you do need to find out what that closure is. Because sometimes it is just, I'm sorry, I came home so tired. And I, I, I just wasn't ready for what you were going to say. I just needed to take a shower. And I should have done that first. Yeah. Maybe it can be as simple as that. Or it, it, it can be uh, something content related, something important. And then you, mm. you have to really talk it through. Yeah. But you do need some sort of closure. But as soon as you're calm, most uh, closures uh, are, are very simple and straightforward because uh, the good thing about um, splitting up, which is uh, one of there's four techniques when you have a, a confrontation, when you, have a, when you don't agree, there are four fundamental techniques. Um, I told you about the um, repeating one crucial point instead yeah. of doing the, the goalpost circus, doing all the... the explaining and examples and and and, and whatnot um the stopping is the third technique just go away for half an hour and then come back 
um, um, the, the good thing about going away and then coming back is you have not spent that half hour throwing in a ton of stuff that is just confusing, just causing more pain, just, you know, dragging each other through this mud and that mud and, and what filth and dirt you can find. It, it, it is stuck there. It's frozen in time, that very first moment where things went wrong. That's the only moment you have to talk about. And it keeps things very clear and very clean. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to go back through these two and a half hours of nonsense and, and BS and, and treating each other like shit. You just go back to that, that moment. Mm. It, that's very functional. When, when you get back together and you have to sort it out, one of the best ways of sorting it out is to um, take turns in um, explaining to the other person just one simple thing. And you, you explain to them uh, about that, that moment, that, that, the flip switch moment, where everything was okay, but then suddenly it wasn't okay anymore. And you tell them when that was and how it happened. And it never happens for two persons at the same time. For the one person, it was when their spouse said this or that. For the spouse, it actually was like two hours before, or maybe at the beginning of the week, or maybe uh, today at, at lunchtime at work. That was where the, the switch flipped. And it, things were already not okay, and they were just being difficult. And they realized that when they have to explain where did the switch flip. Mm -hmm. And it, it, usually you, you win 50% of the battle that way by just uh, describing your own flip switch moment, as I call it. Yeah. My moment like that was when Nancy put her 44 Magnum on the table. <laughs> <laughs> was it I loaded? Was not, well, of course it was. <laughs> you, know, that, you know, you leave that thing all over the place, eventually somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that last one resonates with me, Jessica, because once you, for most of us, once we stop and realize that we've gained some insight into the other person's behavior, and I, and I wasn't the cause of it. Something else was, or maybe I was the cause of it, and I have to have to assume responsibility. But once you you gain insight into someone's behavior, and you love that person, it does tend to to calm that situation down because now you've learned something that will be a positive going going forward and that's a that's a that's a brilliant way to to be able to frame it hmm. it usually works quite well so when when you're um, not in conflict when there is no disagreement of any sort then there are these obvious things that we do when we talk to other people like we give each other the chance to uh, finish saying what they're saying right let me finish the sentence typical thing of course when when you're just having fun and you're, you're you know you're having a conversation you let them finish their sentence now when there is a disagreement there are um, various occasions where it is very useful to interrupt and usually most people do not learn how to interrupt they just don't learn that because we, we, we're told it's it's rude, it's impolite, you don't do that, you let people finish their sentence, blah, blah, blah. Yes, that's what you do when everything is fine. But when things are not so fine, it may be very useful to interrupt someone. Yeah, Christina. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I interrupt everyone. <laughs> Well, it can make sense. And you know the, the best instructions for good interruptions? You know where you can find those? In books on etiquette. Oh. They are the, some of the best psychology books out there are etiquette books. Do read one when you get the chance. Mm -hmm. they're, they're amazing. And they explain these obvious situations where you think, oh, God, yes, I need to interrupt. <laughs> Like, you know, you, you throw this big party and the ambassador has been invited, but your uncle has also been invited. And, you know, he when he starts talking about politics, just things go horribly wrong. And you see him drifting towards the ambassador and you think, no, 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 no. <laughs> so 
that's where you interrupt. You 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 grab some glasses and you jump in between the two and you you yell something about you know the exhibition, the museum, anything. You know, you just just stop them and you take the ambassador. You say, "Sorry, uncle, I have to introduce the ambassador to somebody else," and you just take them to the other end of the room. And that's what the etiquette books say you should do. They explain how to interrupt and how strategic it can be and how positive and useful it can be. Now, I can give you a very simple example where you feel you would rather have been interrupted. I, I can, I, I think I can do that. So, suppose you want to go to the movies. You decide we want to go to the real movies. We go out there, we take the car, and we, we go out there, and we sit in that real thing, and we have the popcorn, and it's, it's big, and there is surround sound, and, and, and the whole charade. Let's do that. And then... Um, the one person says, I want to see the new horror movie. And the other person thinks, oh, no, 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 no. No, I want to see that comedy. Um, so suppose the horror movie person, they, they just take off. Yes, I want to see that movie and I, this actor and this actress and blah. And I've, I've seen their, their previous work and it's really good. If you let them talk, if you let them talk for too long before you say, um, uh, maybe a comedy? Um, they will feel a little bit, you know, you know that feeling mm -hmm. when they let you talk for too long mm -hmm. and you think, mm -hmm. you should have just said that you don't like this. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's those occasions, the, the etiquette books tell you interrupt, just interrupt, shrug or make a gesture or say, really? You know, just give a signal we're not on the same page. Do it as quickly as possible. That is more polite than letting them take off all the way to the moon and back before you tell them this was not your route. So a good way to interrupt is you have your glass of champagne with you or your glass of or your beer and you just <laughs> spill it on somebody automatically in front of you. Yes. In order to yes. Excellent. Yes. I you do that all the time. Hot coffee. Hot coffee works. Coffee works yeah, whether it's well. good, I don't know. <laughs> I think Kevin's doing it very well during this therapy session. He actually shows <laughs> some change of behavior and some improvement. Thank you, Jessica. You've helped all of us. <laughs> I, I feel less monkey-like right now, and I feel a bit more uh, human. <laughs> so, so now we all go out and get our Miss Manners book, and that will help. I think it's a great piece this. of advice. I yeah. think it's a great piece of advice, a, a book on etiquette. I think it's a great piece of advice. It, of course, it, the, the whole thing about that book, and that's why it's great psychology, it, um, it, it basically tries to help you to make your own output of as high a quality as possible. So if you want quality in your life and you are there 24 hours to work on your own output, why not start there? Mm -hmm. Why not put every possible effort into your own output and its quality? Makes perfect sense. I think it's a return to civility, which is, as, as the politicians keep telling us, is, is lacking in our civilization at this and, point. And there is a bit of a charm from the old ways, too. Yeah. You know? I, wish, I wish you could introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Kevin. I am son of Andre, grandson of Leopold, and guardians of the family's values and traditions. I mean, you don't say that today. Say, yo, how you doing? You know? I know. I know. I totally agree. We should totally get back to that. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I, seriously, I have uh, had people in, in couples therapy where uh, one of them, and I, I don't want to be sexist here, but usually it's the guy, <gasps> just sits there and leans back. And uh, when I confront him and I say, okay, so you, you want to be like this, the way I see you act here now, and you expect your family life at home to be fun and full of joy and, and entertaining and, and full of sweetness. Um, but how do you think that will come about if this is what you are contributing to it? And that, like they stare at me like, huh? Mm -hmm. Should I contribute to something nice in the whole? You know, so there are really there are people who just forgot how to reflect on their their own output on what they contribute to the atmosphere in the house. I guess you it's feel that uh, their mere presence is contribution enough. <laughs> well, well, yeah. <laughs> Or the opposite. <laughs> Jessica, thank you so much. This was great. I love this. This, yeah. this was great advice. Yeah, it is. When you get into human dynamics, yes. it can go horribly. It could be go wonderfully or, or horribly wrong, you know. And it, it's good to have some techniques mm -hmm. to keep them from going that wrong. So, so if, if we're going to summarize all this, was I correct when I said, you know, uh, when it comes to conflict resolution and de-escalation, uh, one, control yourself. 
you know, uh, because I'm taking notes here. And two, do not reward aggressive behavior by keeping uh, the engagement. You know, walk away yep. if the, the person that's having the problem is not walking away. And if you realize you're the one that's having the issue, isolate yourself, regroup yourself, and come back with a more positive attitude. Would I be correct in summarizing this briefly? Yes, totally. Fantastic. Jessica, <laughs> thank you so much for helping us with this on the show. I hope there are, our listeners really benefit from this. That was fantastic. Uh, if people want to find out more about your work and what you do, where can they reach you? Um, yeah, well, there's the forensic thing. I'm not that out on the internet, really. That's your um, so email would be best. Okay. Um, and that would be, yes, I, I'll, I'll pronounce it in Dutch. It's head consult, mm-hmm. um, which would be H-E-T and then the word consult mm-hmm. at accessforall.nl. And we'll put that in the Access, notes. Access, yeah. And we'll put that Just in the notes of the show as well. Perfect. Awesome. Jessica, thank you so much for all this. But before we let you go, I got to have you say, hi, I'm Jessica. What do I say? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jessica Terwheel, and I took a left at the valley. Hi, I'm Jessica Terwheel, and I took a left at the valley. And that was our friend Jessica Terwheel. God, she's so lovely. I love her. Oh, I do too. That was a great Jessica, therapy. can you become the official therapist for yep. Left of the Valley we Crew? Need we it. need you. Yeah. <laughs> What's going to happen when we now get so nice and so calm that we <laughs> that I, we no longer have, have these wonderful conversations you're and You're going to be even scarier because now you're going to be nice before you kill people. <laughs> we become coming. the ultimate Canadian. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Peak Canadian. <laughs> That was, I thought, that was a lot of great information. It and was. A lot of great I hope advice. you learned a lot, Kevin. Of, yeah. of course I did. You know. <laughs> and I really don't want to talk about that uh, toilet brush back scratcher thing anymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, sure hope we'll have her back. And uh, we're certainly looking forward to hearing again from Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was great work. I, I, you did a great job of summarizing uh, all of her I love her how points. you were taking this, notes. Yeah. I was listening. I yeah. was listening. <laughs> You know, yeah. well, she's, a lovely, she's a lovely person, and it was a, it was a joy having I, her. I don't have a choice. I can't really confront you guys. You guys are outnumbering me, and I learned my lesson a couple hey, of weeks ago. we're nice. I wasn't here <laughs> for that, so you can't blame me for not sticking Thank you so much for being with us today, and thank you for listening to the show. And thank you to our guest, Jessica Terwill. Uh, that was a great show. So uh, you can follow us at leftofthevalley.com. You can uh, uh, you can uh, send us an email at left at valley at outlook.com. You can uh, follow us on uh, Facebook, on uh, Twitter at LT Podcast, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Where's my schedule? I don't have it. I ate it. Okay. Coming up next week, we'll be talking to Stephen Woodworth of the Rationality Rules. That'll be great. And we'll be talking to a couple of uh, ladies over the podcast Forsaken Faith. And forward to that one. In early October, we'll be talking to our old friend David Fitzgerald. Mm-hmm. He's coming back and being in October to talk to us about John the Baptist. Nobody ever thinks about John the Baptist. I want to hear more about the history of the man. Yeah, he'll do a great job. And we have to start wrapping up our spe- Halloween special. I've already started looking for something to read. Yes, I need to talk to Seth Andrews because he kind of promised he would come back and give us one of his stories. Yes. So let's get that going. I need to get going on that one. Perfect. Anything else we need to say before we go? Um, stay, stay calm. Stay calm. And read Harry Potter. Yes. If you need to de-escalate by walking away and read Harry exactly. Potter, do so. Or is it she's pressing pressing her point so much until you finally get it? Uh, yeah, get Patronus walk it away. Thomas. That's my Harry Potter show. Thank you so much, guys. Until next time. Say that Horus isn't real, but Jesus is. Or Zeus, Thor, Mithra, Vishnu, you don't believe in them. Perfect. Yes. So there, it, this is a little bit scary for me because I've been a forensic psychologist for 20 years. Uh, I just want to put this out there, um, uh, which means that um, you deal with the criminally insane and you are required, obviously, to have a secret address and unlisted phone number um, and, and, and all that stuff. Uh, I had a P.O. box so that I never had to put my address out anywhere, stuff like that. And I didn't have my my picture or anything about me on the Internet anywhere at all. And and so this is... uh, I I have to go against my... (laughs) 
deeply ingrained instincts and, and tendencies. Well, the fact that you've dealt with the criminally insane makes you more than qualified to deal with us. <laughs> We're really glad you come fully prepared to deal with us, especially when you can talk about de-escalation. This is going to turn out. This is going to turn out well. Yeah. Take a say, don't mean to sound so hateful, but I swear to God, unintended, I find it disgraceful that many atheists are told to be quiet. You're not alone. Speak your mind, time to let it be known. I'm proud to be an atheist, a skeptic, a non believer, an infidel, a heathen. I call it how I see it. I say it's ignorance, and you just call it faith and unsubstantiated claims. That's something to be ashamed. I'm an atheist, atheist, atheist. 